Arab Tov Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. I uh, laid my microphone somewhere down after being out in the field doing the Chinese president yesterday. Just don't know where I laid it down at, either somewhere in the house, somewhere in the car. One, so if you get a little bit of an echo or not as good a quality, I apologize for that. We'll have that fixed by this afternoon. Uh, anyway, war drums are beating in Europe, and of course, the Temple Institute is pre preparing for the priesthood. These are some of the top stories that we are looking at today, and we want to go right into that with you. Russia vows total uh, asymmetrical response to major U.S. troop buildup in Europe, according to RT News. That came out today on the 31st here. Uh, according to Alexander uh, Grushkov, he said here, we are not passive observers. We consistently take all the military uh, measures we consider necessary in order to counterbalance this re uh, re reinforced presence that is not justified by anything. Moscow's permanent representative at the Alliance, Alex Alexander uh, Groskov, uh, said in an interview with TV channel Russia 24 on Wednesday certainly will respond totally asymmetrically, he states there. Uh, he goes on to say, has not, he's not, uh, Rusko has not elaborated further on his statement, but said that Russia's actions would, would correspond to its understanding of the extent of the military threat, would not be extremely expensive, but also highly effective. That pretty much tells me nuclear weapons. I'm not saying the nuclear weapons are not expensive, but it's a heck of a lot cheaper to fire off a few nukes than it is to sit there and constantly have manned huge battalions on its border. But no doubt they'll have that as well. But in order to do their response, as Russian President Vladimir Putin has stated many times before, Russian nukes are always on the table when they feel that they're overwhelmed with force. As of today, he says, Assessing as a whole what the U.S. and NATO are doing, the point at issue is a substantial change for the worse in the security situation, he said. It is getting worse, friends, and uh, we may actually go and try to get that, uh, that news for you as well firsthand. So um, we may be doing a trip here very soon to Latvia and Poland. Uh, anyway, on March 22nd, or 26, 2016, RT News reported another interesting incident that took place. Russian Defense Minister plane followed by NATO jets over the Baltic Sea. Uh, if you go to RT News, you can actually see the footage there where they're using maybe their phones or whatever to video this, and you can see the NATO jets. They're very plain in sight. Of course, Russia has all of their warplanes surrounding him, but why would NATO fighters follow the Russian uh, defense minister. Very unusual thing. The article stated heading towards Kaliningrad over the neutral waters in the Baltic Sea, Russian defense minister Sergei Soigu plane got shadowed by a bunch of NATO fighters that kept the distance of two kilometers from his aircraft, media reported. That's within shooting range. Uh, just wonder why is NATO just doing it to be provocative or, or what? Or do they not trust him? If it's in neutral waters, what's the issue? Another bit of news that came out today reported on Fox News, March 31st, 2016. At least 10 pe people are reported killed. 150 believe trapped after an over overpass collapsed in India. Instead, it states here, an army troops join efforts to rescue those trapped inside cars trucks and other vehicles that lay under a mass of concrete blocks and metal debris. Witnesses said that the emergency personnel were attempting to use their bare hands to rescue those caught under the wreckage. Local media reported that heavy-duty cranes had been brought in to try to move the remains of the bridge, but attempts have so far been unsuccessful. Uh, it is known that in India, the, the builders often use poor grade material in building uh, anything that they're building, their, their buildings, etc. So I'm just interested to know what's going to end up being the cause of the failure of this bridge. And as you can see in the photo right here, this one car here, I don't see how you could even have a survivor. Uh, just people are just mangled in piles and piles of rubble. And some of the people, according to the article, were stating that work, uh, the, the crews for coming and rescue was so disorganized and, and no one uh, really doing anything about it. It was just chaos on the ground. Uh, and I'm sure the people are just panicking, that not knowing what they could do. And uh, of course, I don't know about four and eight, if they could even get the big enough cranes there to move things. I see the cranes here. I've actually run cranes uh, 
one time, long time ago when I was young. Uh, but anyway, uh, my stepdad owned a business that did this. So it, it's just really um, odd what's going on here. Uh, continuing on right here, Israel cuts power to Jericho over ongoing PA debt. Israel National News reported that today on March 31st, 2016. We've actually followed this for quite some time in the news there in Israel. We haven't actually brought that up to the people thus far, but we have been watching uh, this situation in Israel and the ongoing uh, months and months of trying to get the Palestinian Authority to be able to pay the electric bill, and they're just not doing it. I know in America, uh, you don't pay your power bill there, buddy, you get cut off. And believe me, the power company doesn't show any mercy. So I guess in this case here, I can understand why Israel's state-ran electric company is also running into the same issue. It says, uh, the electric company was set Thursday to reduce the power supply one of the Palestinian Authority's major cities over a debt of 450 million, that's US dollars, it's like 1.6 billion uh, uh, shekels, uh, says even, uh, we, excuse me, we've informed all the relevant parties and after endless attempts to reach arrangements, we've decided to act, uh, reduce the debt, the official said, adding that the Jericho move was open-ended, Israeli official said. You know, if it was me, I would have actually cut the electricity to wherever Mahmoud Abbas happens to be. I wouldn't have worried about Jericho. I'd make sure that he's dealing with the pain and suffering with it. That's the way it would be done. Uh, maybe to kind of get him to the negotiating table. And as far as the negotiating table, I would say that there's not going to be two states. It's going to be one state, and your people can either become citizens of that state or... We can be talking to Syria to see if they can't get you a little area there as they divide that country up. Anyway, the Temple Institute is inaugurating historical registry of the biblical eligible Kohanim according to the title of their video. Uh, you can look it up March 28, 2016. It is on their own things there. I want you to listen to this just uh, momentarily here. Listen to what uh, Rabbi says there about that. Rabbi Chaim to share an exciting announcement with you today in advance of this week's special Torah reading of Parshat Para. The Temple Institute is now inaugurating a historic and unprecedented program that will identify and select Kohanim whose status of biblical purity enables them to attend to the preparation of the Red Heifer. This is the second stage of the Institute's far-reaching efforts to restore biblical purity to the world, a continuation of our ongoing program of raising Red Heifers in Israel. Kohanim are male Jews who are of patriarchal descent of Aaron, and thus members of the priestly tribe. If you are a Kohen, born and residing in Israel, and have exercised caution with regards to the laws of biblical purity, you may be eligible to participate in this program. For more information, or to help with these efforts, contact us at redheifer at templeinstitute.org. That's very concerning to me, um, especially in light of different scripture passages that I'd like to share just a couple here. Uh, one, of course, the famous quote by Yeshua himself in John chapter 15, verse 13. He says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Uh, this is what uh, this is exactly what Adam did in order to bring forth his own bride. It's what Yeshua did in order to bring forth his bride. There had to come a restoration of the Holy Spirit. And it was in Yeshua's blood that that life in a plural form was within him contained in that human body. And he had to lay his life down. His blood had to come out. Coming out from his side, by the way, the nails in his hand really is not the, the significance of the... Uh, the prophecy of Zechariah. Zechariah says that he was thrust through, and when he was thrust through, henceforth went blood and water. It was separated there. That showed show that he was clearly the fulfillment of the prophecy uh, by Moses, which God said, take the elders of Israel with you and smite the rock, that it bring forth its waters. Uh, this is that fulfillment right there. That was when his life came out of him, just as God took the life uh, uh, from Adam's side, because it does say mean ish from the man, or literally from the fire of Yahweh that was in that man, 
uh, Adam, that is, God took and made Isha, another, the feminine, uh, the, the feminine compound word of the fire of God, uh, making his wife. Remember, he says, uh, He breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life in a plural form, just as Yeshua afterwards breathes on his disciples after his resurrection, says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. This is that confirmation. Now, when we look at this reestablishment of the Kohanim, many people uh, refer to uh, Ezekiel's prophecies or in the, the latter part of his book there in the chapters 40. Uh, one friend of mine actually stated that he believed that this is uh, more than likely prophetic in nature, speaking about that they would reinstitute the temple sacrifices, but it would be a temporal uh, thing that would be done and that it would uh, that's brother Conrad by the way in case you're wondering brother Conrad on uh, on YouTube there stated this to me and that it would actually be done away with with the coming of the Mashiach uh, when he returns the second time I do agree with that analogy there because you have to understand Levitical law was brought in as a permissive will of God it makes sense because notice what in the book of Hebrews states here but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering, thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Uh, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book of it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. So even in the book of Hebrews, it does clearly show to us that it was indeed part of the law. But it was not a perfect will of God's law, and we know that Yeshua was reestablishing those things back to the beginning. He even says that, like when he mentions marriage and divorce. It was not so from the beginning. Okay, and, and one other thing. I didn't put it actually in this particular uh, program here, but let me just quickly bring this up for you. I think it would be worth uh, you taking a look at this as well, friends. This... Uh, passage here uh, is actually in the book of um, the book of Ezekiel and I wanted to share that with you because it makes more sense in what uh, is being said by both Yeshua and the writer of the book of Hebrews there are some that believe it was Paul uh, it's also believed that the book of Hebrews was written by Aquila there are different um, um, scholars that have suggested that it was actually written by Aquila there. Uh, so let me just pull that up for you. I've got to get this back on the screen for you. I see that the screen has uh, actually been... Uh... All right, if we let's take a look from uh, verse 17 here. Chapter 20 of the book of Ezekiel says, Nevertheless, mine eyes spared them from destroying them, neither did I make a full end of them in the wilderness. Talking about the Israelites when they were in the wilderness journey, the 40-year journey. And he said, I said unto their children in the wilderness, Walk ye not in the statutes of your fathers, neither observe their ordinances, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them. Now, some think people think that's Levitical law that he's speaking about. But if you watch what he says here, it's not the Levitical law. It's the Ten Commandments and the two statutes which Moses gave in Deuteronomy from Mount Horeb and said, and he added no more. It's interesting because Ezekiel clears that up for you. Watch what he says. Verse 20, And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, and that you may know that I am the Lord your God. But the children rebelled against me. They walked not in my statutes, neither kept my ordinances to do them. Which if a man do, he shall live by them. They profaned my Sabbaths, that I said I would pour out my fury upon them to spend my anger upon them in the wilderness. Nevertheless, I withdrew my hand and wrought for my name's sake that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations in whose sight I brought them forth. So in other words, God did not do any evil to them. But watch what he says. I lifted up my hand unto them also in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the nations and disperse them through the countries. That's prophecy, friends. 
That was a prophecy speaking of when Yeshua would come because they don't stop the sacrificial system. All right, and I'll show you how we know this. Because they had not executed my ordinances, but had rejected my statutes and had profaned my Sabbaths and, the, Sabbaths and their eyes were after their father's idols. Wherefore, here it is, I gave them also statutes that were not good. All right. And ordinances whereby they should not live. There's where the Levitical law comes in. So, yes, God did give that Levitical law. He did give the sacrificial system, but it was not good, as, as Ezekiel clearly states here. And it was something that God, it was not his perfect will. His perfect will was them keeping his commandments and statutes, all right? Yeshua, though, it is clear that Yeshua was to come. He had to come no matter what. That's why the Bible clearly states that he would give his life. That was in order to release the Holy Spirit to, to rebring back what was lost in the Garden of Eden. Watch what he says, verse 26, And I polluted them in their own gifts. And by the way, the gifts there in Hebrew... Those gifts, it literally comes from the word that, that is the sacrificial system. Be pe to, to, to notam. See, the, the be, which is in, mot, it's death, notam. It's, it's the sacrificial gifts that they are offering. That's ex you know that if you know Hebrew. That's how you can know what's going on there. It says and that they set apart all that openeth the womb again, that is speaking of the animals themselves. Has nothing to do with your firstborn child. Of course, they ended up offering children as well, but it's clearly speaking of that, that I might destroy them to the end, that they might know that I am the Lord. So friends, he did, yes, the father set up and give them this, this sacrificial system that they wanted. It's what they were doing in Egypt. Moses tried to get them to the perfect will of God. They just would not do it. And that's how it came in to be. That's why we see in the scripture that as Yeshua said, no greater love than a man laid down his life for his friends. As it says by the writer of the book of Hebrews uh, as well, beautiful passage there that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin and that there's always a remembrance of sin. But that life that Yeshua gave for us in his blood, where that soul, that life that was in there, more than one life, because it was our life to fill us with the Holy Spirit, that was the true sacrifice. And his sacrifice is what gave us eternal life. So the priests are coming together with the Temple Institute. They're going to restart that temple sacrifice, but I will not accept any greater sacrifice than was already made by Yeshua. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom.